Good evening and welcome to today's session, Teachers Top Tips, and we are joined by Kelly Hoskins, who will do an introduction for herself in a minute, um, who will be able to provide a primary teacher's perspective on education outreach and how we can get involved and specifically where our intervention is needed the most. I'm Yelna Gatasha and I'm the Education Outreach and Safeguarding Lead at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've been at the institution for four years now. I was previously in um, a slightly different role where I had operational responsibility of four of our five student challenges as well as education. And now my role is fully education focused with the student challenges falling under events. Um, I think this role and this training is very much in line with what the institution repositioning more broadly within the institution and last year education and skills was announced as a policy priority area. Um, education is something that cuts across almost all institutional activities, so it's much far further reaching than the education team, and we really do have that lifelong learning provision, um, which goes across divisions and groups in all different areas of the IMECI and across all different parts of um, and grades of engineer as well. Um, this is the second in this year's calendar of trainings that we will be providing free to IMECI members with the hope of providing CPD and upskilling for members and hopefully um, giving a bit of an insight to those that perhaps haven't been involved in the past as to what it means to get involved in outreach, how they can do so and hopefully providing that guidance and best practice um, that we can go on thereafter and share among um, networks and uh, hopefully an outreach. And I think that will be it from me. I will pass on to Alex and um, provide more details of upcoming sessions. Please do share these. All of the recordings, they're all available on the web pages I mentioned a little bit earlier. So you can revisit any of the materials or if you would like to pass it on to someone who perhaps has been considering getting involved in an outreach or might find it useful. So thank you very much and I'll pass on to Alex now. Thanks, Yelena. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for giving up your evening to join us again. Um, this is fantastic to see you. Um, and hopefully we're going to have a fun hour talking about STEM outreach, specifically at a primary level. Um, as Yelena said, we are very privileged to be joined by Kelly Hoskin. Uh, I've worked with Kelly a little bit in my amazing role as well. And she always provides fantastic insights and tips about from a primary teacher perspective. Um, so looking forward to getting into that discussion in a little bit. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. And as I do, if people who are on the call can put in the chat whether you are already a STEM ambassador or not. So are you a registered STEM ambassador or are you not yet? Um, that would be useful for us to just know uh, who we've got in the audience, please, if you can do that. Thank you. And I will share my screen. Fantastic. All right. So yes, as Yelena said, we um, I'm just going to go on to this slide here where where we are in the, the training series. So we've already had our first one about getting uh, hopefully inspiring people to do more STEM outreach and making 2023 your year of inspiration. Um, and then this this month, we're on teachers top tips looking at primary level. Um, and then next, month we have got our in-person uh training event down in London and then after that we've got another bunch of online events so one looking at secondary specifically looking at routes you know how we as STEM ambassadors provide advice on routes into engineering we've got another in-person event in the north planned um so loads and loads of stuff for you to get involved with which hopefully will be really informative and and motivating and insightful for you um for those who don't know me I'm just going to go back a quick slide um, I'm I'm Alex Knight and I am a mechanical engineer myself. Uh, I'm a fellow with the IMECI and I've worked in engineering industry for over 15 years before 
setting up STEMazing, which is a not-for-profit all about inspiration and inclusion in STEM. So I do a lot now to support STEM ambassadors in STEMazing. We focus on gender diversity and women in STEM, but with the IMECE, we are open to absolutely everyone. We, we need absolutely more STEM ambassadors getting out there and spreading the word about engineering. So it's great to work with both men and women from the IMECE. And we also have on the call some of our IMECI REOs, regional education officers, um, who are fantastic points of contact for local insight and inspiration and to let you know what's going on in your region. Um, maybe, Yelena, in the chat, you could share the link to how people find out who their regional or their, their, their local REO is if they don't know already. Right, so looking at the chat then, we've got uh, Ian is already an ambassador, um, Penny not officially registered yet, um, EK, I'm not sure that has not yet, but planning to register, great, Alex, yeah, you're obviously STEM ambassador, uh, Bing, yes, Chris, not yet, Nick, Oh, yeah, well done. Nick signed up and accepted earlier this week. Fantastic. And John STEM ambassador. OK, lovely. So we've got a bit of a mix then um, of people in the audience, at different stages of uh, your journey, if you like, of being a STEM ambassador. Um, so hopefully we can provide support and information that will help you in whatever stage you are, whether you are just starting out. Um, or whether you're already an experienced STEM ambassador and looking to enhance and improve your skills and toolbox. So what we're going to do today is we're going to, I really want this, you know, we, we're a nice group here. I think it's a good size group to have some discussion going. So as we're talking about STEM outreach focused at primary level, um, it'd be really useful to know if, um, you know, what your experiences are, if you've done primary STEM outreach before, um, what worked well for you, where you had the challenges. So feel free to put any of your experience around primary outreach into the chat or put your digital hand up and we can come to you. Um, and as, as I'm sort of interviewing Kelly, if you like, asking her some questions and getting her top tips from a primary teacher perspective. If any questions at all pop into your mind or thoughts or comments, again, feel free to put those in the chat because this session is to help you. So we very much want you to, to get what you need out of it. So please uh, don't be shy. Feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat. All right. OK, so with primary level STEM outreach um, for young children, I thought it might be useful just to remind people about the key stages for young children that we talk about in England. Um, so I don't know how this relates to other countries, if I'm honest. So I know we had, uh, who was it, Ranadeb calling in from India. Um, so it'd be useful, actually, if you know what your uh, different age groups are called in, in school. Um, but in the UK, we have different key stages. And key stage one is year one and two, which is age five to seven. So the very young children. Before that, you have reception. But key stage one is age five to seven when they're in year one and two. Then we have key stage two, which is split into lower key stage two and upper key stage two. So in lower key stage two, you've got the age seven to nine year olds. And in England, we call that year three and four. And then in upper key stage two, you've got nine to 11 year olds. And in England, we call that year five to six. So it's useful because when you are talking to teachers, sometimes they will mention key stages and assume that everybody knows what they're talking about because it's very, um, very common language for teachers to talk in key stages um, but if if you've been out of education for a little while and certainly it's been a while since we've all been <laughs> young children um, then th this language can be a bit alien so I think it's a useful reminder. Um, so yes if you can just put in the chat then if you do you have experience with primary level outreach um, and maybe just put you know a quick sentence or a couple of words as to what 
you've been doing at a primary outreach level or if you've done it loads or if you've done it once or if you've not done it at all so we can get a feel for the level of experience of primary STEM outreach within the audience today. Um, great, thank you, John. I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, John says he had an excellent STEM event with primary school children, so he's gonna tell us about that a bit later. Great. Um, oh, fantastic, thanks, Bing. So is, that's a... Um, that's that's a point that we can we can bear in mind. So give the inspiration of what an engineer can do. Explain the science behind it. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. That's a great thing that we can do as, as STEM ambassadors. Ian says I've been engaging with primary for about eight months, and it is the most rewarding experience. That's fantastic. Thank you, Ian. Great job. So I'd love to hear more about the kind of stuff you're doing. Maybe you can um, tell us more about that a bit later on. Um, Nick, not at all yet. And Alex, mostly secondary, so none from uh, the primary level. Absolutely fine. That's fine. And I think that's that's the kind of common thing. Like some people feel really comfortable working with older children, um, and 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 maybe like this is my experience of a lot of women that I'm trying to encourage to do more STEM outreach. They've done talks and careers events and things like that at a secondary school level. Um, but the idea of working with very young children can be terrifying. But I think once you've done it once, like Ian says, you realise just how rewarding it is. And I really feel like it's extremely important for us to reach young children as engineers and tell them what engineers do. So exactly like Bing was saying, it's really important that we show young children what engineers are, what they do, how they make a difference in the world. So absolutely, we can we can get in there and, and kind of inform and, and influence and inspire those children. Oh, great. Well done, Penny. Ran STEM workshops with primary children in person pre-COVID and over the last two years completed some virtual role modelling STEM work with smart STEMs. Great. That's fantastic. And I love that mix of online and in person. And maybe we can talk with Kelly a bit about that, about what works really well as well. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic. OK, so I am going to invite Kelly to come onto the screen. So hopefully, Kelly, if you can, uh, if, you, if you say hello, I think you'll pop up on my screen. And hello, everyone. Hi. There we go. Fantastic. Um, awesome. So, Kelly, can you um, give us a bit of an introduction to you, first of all? Um, and your background relating to to primary level teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a qualified teacher and I have had um, several years working in a primary school. I came into teaching later in life, based myself in, well, primary I taught reception, which is as they come in at age four um, and focused up to year um, age seven. But I have since, um, I now specialise in working with children on a one-to-one -one basis who have learning difficulties. So my specialty is dyslexia and dyscalculia. And dyscalculia is the numbers form of dyslexia, which is widely misunderstood, but absolutely fascinating. So I'm very lucky I get to do, um, you know, really great work with children one-to-one. -one. Um, I got involved with STEM Amazing because one of my daughters, I have three daughters, one of them is a STEM ambassador. She's a chemical engineer um, working in the New Forest um, and is passionate about STEM. Um, and my other two daughters, I have one finishing a science degree and one finishing a maths degree. So I am an absolute STEM, <laughs> um, absolute advocate for STEM. So I'm really proud to be here because you know, I'm a huge believer in it. So, yes, thank you for having me. Great. So it's so good to have you, Kelly. And that is amazing. Well done as a human being getting three <laughs> daughters to go into STEM. That's amazing. Um, and, and thanks for everything you do uh, in your work with young people as well, because you know, we need more amazing people like you. And it's so valuable for us as STEM ambassadors. Um, you know, so we are all engineers here and we are not necessarily taught how to communicate with young children. We don't go through that sort of uh, education training like you do when you become a teacher. And we maybe are used to communicating in a professional setting and talking to other adults 
and talking at a technical level about what we're doing at work. But the idea sometimes of translating that into something that is relevant and inspiring and engaging um, and accessible for young people can be quite daunting. So um, I'm really looking forward to your advice about how we can be more effective STEM ambassadors. And also, like we've put in the subtitle here, make our STEM delivery effective so actually have a, a positive impact um, and fun. <laughs> and I think that is so important at any age, but especially when we're working with young children. Um, so the first point we were going to uh, talk about, because we've had a chat about this before, sort of key points we wanted to bring up, is your mantra that I have come to realise is your mantra, mantra around connection before education. So can you just explain to us what you mean by that? Um, yes, I absolutely believe in this. So I believe that the, the best way to reach ch children is to actually connect with them on, on a real level, on an emotional level, because once they're open to you, they're open for learning. So examples would be when you meet with them, it's either in person or online. It's really important to make sure you smile with your eyes, that you genuinely mean that you're smiling and that you're happy to be there letting them know that actually this is as much fun for you as for them um, is really important so they relax into it and they believe in you. Um, I think letting them know that you are actually a real person. So what your job is, what your name is, where you live. Um, one of the first things my daughter did when she started as a STEM ambassador was actually put a slide up because she was working in a school, with a school in Scotland, but she was actually, she's based in Southampton. So she did a little slide of an aeroplane and how far it was away. So the children could see actually where she was in relation to them. But again, that she's an absolute real person, you know, spending her time, giving up her time to do this. Um, I think letting them know what your job is, letting them know maybe what your dreams were when you were their age. I like to think of STEM as a, it's a six week program. So it's getting to know the children over six weeks, but getting allowing them to get to know you over the six weeks. So mm. maybe all of, you don't need to deliver all of this information in the first lesson, but over the weeks it might be, oh, this is what I've been doing this week and this is what my job entails. And I was really excited because I got to do this. So they actually, you take them on your journey as much as you're on their journey in, in getting to know each other. And just on that point, so so the STEM ambassadors here today may not be involved in this amazing program, but from their perspective, that that point around connection before education. So even if you're only doing a one off activity going into a school, still thinking about how you introduce yourself in a way that allows you to connect with the children. Um, and one of the things that I do actually since talking to you about this is talk about the fact that I've got children and my children are roughly their age and I show a picture of my children, I show a picture of our dog <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the kids love that. They say, all oh, right, so you're actually a real person and your kids are my age and you've got a dog, yay, what's your dog's name? You know, is always a question. And so I love that, that idea of actually just being a real person as well as an engineer to mm -hmm. them. A really mm -hmm. good one, yeah. yeah. And when I, when I was teaching science at school, we would, um, we would pretend to put our science hats on and pretend to put our white coats on. And they just thought that was so much fun getting into the role. Um, and it is bringing this, you know, the, the fun aspects of learning into STEM, I think. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Great, so connection before education, a key one, I think we can all learn from that. And it's a very simple thing to do and it only needs to take a few minutes at the start of the session that we're doing rather than jumping straight into this is what engineering is and 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 this is what we're doing today just take a moment to just connect with the audience brilliant um another thing we've talked about before which is important is the delivery style so from a primary teacher perspective what are the things we should bear in mind whether we're delivering this in person or online about our delivery style as a STEM ambassador? Um, okay, delivery style. I think we, um, it's useful to have some behavior management techniques. Mm -hmm. I think as people, 
as professionals who maybe aren't familiar with being with young children, it can feel very intimidating. Um, I think we have to remember we're working with the teacher. The behaviour management will already be set either in a classroom or in a whole school situation. Um, so understanding what that behaviour management is, allowing the teachers to be part of what you're doing, I think is really important. It's working together as a team. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to think about using our voice in a confident way. But there are tricks in teaching. So, for example, you can lose your voice from a lot of shouting. But actually, children often respond really well to when you use a quiet voice. Because when you speak quietly, they strain to listen because they think they might be missing something. So we can actually use the range of our voice and the contrast in our voice to actually deliver the information and to get their attention better. If we cast our minds back to our best teachers, the ones that were shouting at us all the time, personally, I think children just close their ears to shouting. The ones who are most effective there is a confidence to them, there is a firmness, but actually it's about being able to listen and, in, and, in, and you want to engage the children. Yeah. So I think the delivery is really important. I think when we talk about online learning, um, for me that was, you know, when COVID happened, I was teaching one-to-one -one with, you know, quite a few children, because um, I work with about 15 children each week. Um, but suddenly we had to go to online learning. And of course you do think, well, will they actually pay attention? But what we have to remember is during the pandemic, one of the most successful forms of online learning was Joe Wicks with his daily PE lesson. <laughs> so, you know, online learning can be very effective. And if we follow the same techniques in terms of engagement and delivery style and using our voice, Thinking about our background, I think, especially with online, that's really important mm -hmm. so we don't have too much going on in the background that's going to distract the children. I mean, I deliberately put pictures of my family and make it feel very homely. Mm -hmm. So they, again, that comes back to being a real person rather than being in a sort of sterile environment. Um, and I think it's, you know, some, some, some classrooms, talking about behaviour management, some classrooms might say, oh, we only ask the children that put their hands up and they're not allowed to shout out. Um, some classrooms may say, I, I never allowed hands up. I would always choose the children. So it might be that if you're working in a classroom situation, you might actually ask for a class list of their first names so you can actually familiarise yourself with the children's names and actually ask them individually. I find that that way the children pay more attention because if you allow it, if you allow the behaviour management just to be anyone who puts their hands up, the ones who aren't sure of the answers never put their hands up. That's true. Yeah. They're never going to get asked. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, they don't have to pay attention because they know they're not going to get asked. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you go the other route and just say, I'm just going to choose someone's name, then they all have to pay attention. So uh, it, it's, it's very different, actually. Yeah, and, and like you so say, you only need their first name or their first name and initial. So from a sort of safeguarding data perspective, it's just a list of their first names. And that's a great thing to talk to the teacher about in advance. How do they, how, how would the teacher suggest it's best to interact with the class, hands up or, or maybe the teacher choosing children to get the variety of children. So not always the same the same old candidates who are always the keen ones with their hands up. Um, I actually had that in as our next point to discuss work with the teacher. And it, this was a this was a bit of a shift for me because I, having been an engineering consultant and worked with clients a lot, I sort of had the mindset of like when I'm going into a school and presenting or working in a class, the teacher is like my client and I have to sort of perform for the teacher and and make sure that the teacher is sort of you know wowed and and that that's the teacher is kind of uh like receiving a good project almost whereas actually thinking like no you're the teacher is there to help you as well and to get the best out of everything for the children so working with them more collaboratively as a member of a partnership almost mm -hmm. that was quite a shift for me and to hear that coming from you as a teacher to say that's what you would actually welcome rather than just having someone turn up, do a bit of a show and then leave again, um, working 
more collaboratively mm-hmm. is a great idea. Um, yes. You know, we have to remember the teachers are going to be hugely grateful for what you're doing. Mm. You know, planning a school day as a teacher, planning the whole day is a lot of work. And knowing that someone's going to come in and do something that they specialize in, that they're passionate about, and you as a teacher can actually take a step back and have the chance to watch the children in your class, actually Mm -hmm. watch them learning, actually be part of their learning. Mm -hmm. I see that as a huge gift that you're giving that teacher. Because as a teacher, when we've got 30 children in front of us and we've got to deliver these lessons and we've got to achieve achieve these levels, there's a huge amount of pressure where you you don't always get the time to watch a child learn because you're so busy delivering the learning. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, you know, any chance to have a person, an, an engineer coming in and talking about what they know about and giving that teacher the time to just sit back and be part of that. It's a real bonus. So you know, don't, don't ever think that a teacher is going to be thinking, well, you know, I've got to put up with you here and I'd rather be teaching my children. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, and you mentioned about behaviour management a little bit there, and it's something that does come up quite often and people are a bit concerned about whether they, as the STEM ambassador, need to be in charge of behaviour management. Mm. Um, but I think like we've talked about before, working with the teacher and understanding, well, what happens if, you know, we lose the audience, essentially, they, they've seen disengaged or they're being rowdy or not paying attention. How do we, how do we work that together? And we, we give advice from the IMEC perspective and from a STEM ambassador training perspective in that it's not your job as the STEM ambassador to Mm -hmm. manage the behavior of the children. The teacher is in the room, maybe a teaching assistant as well. So your job is to deliver your STEM session. Mm -hmm. Um, And like say, use some hints and tips with with your voice volume and pace and and how enthusiastic you are to keep the children engaged. But ultimately the behavior management is the responsibility of the teacher. But you can, like you've put a point here saying, catch them being good. I like that phrase. You can still reinforce good behavior when you see it or or even great questions or or whatever. Yes. So good. So catch them being good. There's there's sort of two ways of teaching. You can you can, you know, get on a child's case every time they do something wrong or you can wait for them to do something good. So, for example, you might say, I like the way that Alice is looking at me so carefully. Now, even if you're online, um, you know, you might set the children off with an activity and while they're doing the activity, just watching for anyone who's doing something really well. So when the children come back, you can say, I really enjoyed watching Emily and Ross work so well together. Tell me about how you managed. Tell me about how your experiment went. Um, And and what I what I find with children, um, and I would like to say at this point that a lot of the tips that we learn about working with children work the same with adults. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of transferable skills here. But, yeah. you know, you, you find a child who maybe struggles in other areas. They might find maths hard. They might find literacy hard. You set them on an activity like this where they have got to be creative and problem solve and suddenly their skills come to the fore. Now, if you can say, well, Martha, that was really amazing how you put the the two tubes together. I hadn't thought of doing like that. You know, why did you do that? And so that little person gets the chance to tell everyone in the group of something that they've done well. And it's like, you know, their shoulders come back and their head lifts up. And Mm -hmm. it's really amazing. I mean, going back to working with the teacher, you know, what you're going to have is you are going to have some learning difficulties in the classroom you're not going to know about those you are going to have some children with behavior difficulties in the classroom again the teacher knows that you don't necessarily but whatever whatever difficulties those children have if you can find something that they're doing well they will respond to that a hundred percent of the time so I like to think of we can set them off with an activity The teacher and the teaching assistant can be there mingling with the children. If you're in person, of course you can. But if you are online, that's your chance to watch that group. 
And, you know, finding out over a course of lessons, if you're lucky enough to do it, the names, you know, not just focusing on, on the ones that are always getting into trouble, just, you know, because you learn those names really quickly. But, you know, find, finding maybe some of the quieter ones and find, you know, just something that they're doing well. Because yeah. what happens is then the others, they want to be praised too. Yeah. So they hear that you're praising Emily and they think, oh, but I was doing something good too. So if I do something good, I'm going to get some praise as well. They respond yeah. really well to that. And I think what I'm picking up here is sort of your, how important interaction is and how important it is as us sort of as the presenter at the front, if you like, whether that's on screen or in person, to remember that it's not just about transmit and receive we're not just literally blurting out our thing and putting it out there especially with young children we want to see how it's going we want to have pause moments for being able to get some feedback ask questions give them the opportunity to ask questions ask the teacher how we're getting on is the pace good so that it's more of a a free-flowing session where with opportunity for interaction which maybe some people feel more uncomfortable with because actually the idea of just kind of delivering your presentation start to finish might be more what they're used to but actually having real planned pause points and and sort of bouncing off the audience to see how they're getting on is um it sounds like it would be a good thing and and getting that interaction going and trying to again it's all about connection isn't it mm -hmm. so trying to connect with the audience and see how how they are receiving it yeah, yeah and another point you've put in here um is about growth mindset. Do you, do you yes. want to just, for yes. those who don't know what that is, do you want to explain what that is and how we can use that in our delivery style? Yes, I think, you know, I, I, I just love the concept of a growth mindset. So really what we're saying here is, you know, you may get some children who think, I'm no good at maths, I'm no good at English. And actually you get grown-ups who say exactly the same. Often the children who are brought to me by their parents to work one-to-one -one will say, well, I'm not good at maths either. So, it, you know, we can either believe we're not good at something or actually we can open our minds and think we can learn. And, and I'm a great believer that actually the first, the most important thing in this is it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my very limited understanding of science, it's all about experimenting and learning from what doesn't go right and then working out how to put it right. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's enough opportunity in the classroom for for children to learn from their mistakes and to actually accept that mistakes are fine, it's how we learn. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's showing children that, okay, we're going to do an experiment. The first time it might not work right, but what can we learn from that? So next time we can try it and do it better. Yeah. And so it's showing them that we can actually explore another way. We need to persevere. Um, and it's building that resilience. So rather than, you know, a lot of the time, especially in maths and, you know, a, a lot of the children I work with, they get their work back. It's full of crosses. They've got it all wrong. Oh, that's a hard feeling for a little person. Mm -hmm. But actually, in the opportunities you're giving them, potentially, they might not get it right the first time. We might come back together as a group halfway through and just say, right, who's, who's having some success? Who's having some difficulty? Oh, you know. Uh, Emily, tell me, what, how did you make that work? Okay, well, what about that, Kate? Maybe you could have a go at that. You know, we can learn from good practice within yeah. our own network, within that own classroom. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, it's that encouraging them to keep going and to keep learning that way. Yeah. I think the type of questioning we use is really useful. I think this is where we need to start practicing our open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. so open-ended questions are, what do you think will happen? How do you know that? What did you notice? So we're not giving them a yes or no option. We're giving them a tell me what you think. Tell me your opinion. Talk about your experience. Now, as adults, developing the art of open-ended questioning is actually quite hard. Yeah. And when we start to pay attention to it, what I recommend is actually you've got a few questions written down and I've got a few questions here. You know, what did you learn today? Tell me about your experience. What did you change? So it's not just a yes and a no. It's a give the chance, the child the chance to talk about what they've done 
because as they verbalize it, they process it in their mind. Yes, I love that. That's where the learning happens. Yeah, Yeah, and and again, like you say, we can apply that to any age, can't we? So thinking about our delivery and maybe having some questions that we are, because asking open questions in the moment can be hard, having some pre-prepared ones or giving ourselves a bit of a heads up of these are the kind of questions I'm going to ask the children to leave it very open and definitely reinforcing that growth mindset around failure is part of learning mistakes happen how do we learn from them and grow and not take it really personally and get crushed from something not working but learn from it um the IMEC has a fabulous whole load of resources of um different stem activities and a lot of them include a reminder for the young people or students about you need some perseverance and resilience because it won't always work first time and how can you learn and improve and iterate so that's fantastic and um, I'm just going to remind people that anyone in the audience here feel free to put your questions for um Kelly into the chat if you've got anything or equally raise your digital hand and I can come to you um because it'd be great to to get your thoughts as well and maybe at this stage sharing any primary outreach you've done and what what worked well and what didn't go so well if there are any challenges so that we can have a bit of a conversation around that um so I remember I think Ian was saying that you did you've done some great primary stem outreach recently so Ian do you want to tell us about that and let us know what was good what was challenging at all Can you, can you hear me and see me on the screen and that? Yes, I can hear yeah. you, absolutely. Okay, so I'm um, retired, as you can probably tell. <clears throat> and I go, I've been doing STEM for about five years, and I used to work for Rolls-Royce down at Bristol on jet engine design, and I actually bought myself a jet engine when they were being sold off by the Ministry of Defence and take it into schools and use it as a backdrop for elementary stuff so I've been doing secondary schools up to now but I think I said at the start I've just over the last eight months or so been going into primary schools with me a little jet engine as a backdrop but we we have great fun and I, it just hit me the first time I did it they were just so enthusiastic and I was a bit uh you know in trepidation of what would happen but the problem that I had the biggest problem is <clears throat> so I run it like um you know the royal institution lectures and we do experiments and they deliberately go wrong and they think it's a riot and everyone who wants to volunteer for every experiment I do. And the only one problem I've had with discipline or, or um, uh, you know, throwing tantrums is somebody couldn't stand that he was never invited to volunteer for the experiment. And there's only about six or eight different experiments we've got time for. But what, but what struck me was, so I do this class, we'll talk about Newton's laws and gravity and apples and friction and all that, based around the problems with designing engines and aircraft, uh, right from reception, right, through to year six of the primary, and they all were just as enthusiastic with each other on a different level. So I check with the teachers what they're learning at school and try and make it relevant, whether it be environmental, whether it be friction, electric engines, things like that. And but I, I was just so fascinated by the fact that they just want to volunteer for everything. And I kind of design it from the start. So I have about 45 minutes to an hour session, depending on how old they are. But um, they just want to volunteer for everything. And they're so en- enthusiastic. And yeah, they just we, we design it. Well, I design it. It's only me doing it. Um, so at the start, everything goes wrong, which I think is incredibly funny. So we start with rocket balloons. And of course, I say, just get them to the other side of the room. And of course, they're because they're a bit wonky and some of them burst or and they, when we blow them up and then none of them reach the other side of the room. And some of them even end up behind where we started and they think that's a riot. And then we try and pro- uh, propel a little model aircraft with one because it doesn't go anywhere because the aircraft do heavy and too much friction in the wheels and all of that. And then we kind of develop it over the 50 minutes that towards the end of it, when they solve those problems, as um, Kelly was saying, uh, the, and see what's wrong and, and we ask them why it goes wrong and what do they think will happen and they, they I'm pretty amazed by they get it right you know why why didn't my airplane work with this rocket balloon well it's too heavy um okay because they're like the rocket balloons are like two grams and then my airplane just look model airplanes probably 200 grams so it's not going to move 
and so I'm kind of developing it. And what I was so everything that Phil has said and you've said, um, yeah, I can I can relate to. So the what they don't well they think it funny when my experiments don't work, but the other discipline not discipline doesn't matter at all thing uh, that goes wrong is when their experiment works they don't like it at all and they kind of can get upset about that. So then, so apart from that, I've now started launching images while I'm coming here too. So I do the fan boats, um, Caroline Alliston's, oh, yes. um, right? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I, I've done that before COVID then stopped for two or three years, obviously, and started that up again. Now they love making things, that's class at a time. And I'm just about to launch um, uh, after this term, water rockets. So, so we've got the fan part, the jet engine, and now we've got the exhaust part, the rocket part of the jet engine, where we have been working with closely with the teacher from my local school to uh, come up and do some designs of experiments because in year five I think they've got to start work look talking about variation and control and we're going to draw some graphs of how to um, maximize the range and the sensitivity to the angle of launch and the amount of water in the rocket which is wow. uh, I think it should be good for them but also, it's um, you, I could take that to secondary school as well to A-level physics people. If you look at the if you look at the physics behind a water rocket and the expansion of the compressed gas and what the optimum water content is, there's a whole paper about it by the National Physics Lab. So obviously, I'm not taking that into primary, but they just they're just going to fire rockets, get wet, and uh, work out what the optimum angle and what the optimum oh, uh, water proportion is for maximum range. That's so and, good. And that's yeah. it. So I can relate to everything you're saying there. And I'm, I'm just thinking after tips to things to make it better, really. <clears throat> that, that already sounds amazing. And I think, Kelly, would you say, you know, with, with those kind of activities where you can differentiate them right from young children up to much older children and sort of how do you pitch it at the right level, though? So is it a case of talking to the teacher in advance, would you recommend or? You know, you also mentioned um, one thing I forgot to bring up here was terminology. So actually introducing terminology that might not be in their curriculum but is would you say as from a teacher's perspective it's still okay to introduce some of those terms like Ian was mentioning some of those terms are probably more complicated than you'd learn at primary school I was amazed how much they knew about Newton yeah. not not just not just yeah the yeah, apple falling there and, and I take an apple and pretend to drop it on Carl's head no. but uh, they they know about Newton's third law when I start talking about you know reaction and action reaction some of the you know year five year six they've heard about Newton, Newton's laws and they can tell me them fantastic oh, okay. yeah. only one or two of them but yeah so they, they and they've done that in their own time that's not on the curriculum yeah 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 so what would you sorry, say I, I, sorry I interrupted the, the, the question just in terms no of no worries no thank you that's great so what do you think Kelly yes I mean I think terminology is really important. I think we have to recognise that subjects like science and maths do have their own vocabulary, but I think if taught properly um, and at the appropriate time, children do pick these words up. And, and I actually think that's really, um, you know, important recognition of actually this is science, these are the words we learn, but they may not know them in the, in the first instance. You know, what we have to remember is that the primary children we're working with have had two, at least two years of interrupted learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the school that I worked most closely with, they have spent a considerable amount of last year focusing on literacy and maths. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the other subjects haven't been given the amount of time they necessarily would have done because there's been a lot of catch up going on. So there may be words that they haven't yet been taught or have, have been exposed to. We might have a word like modelling, modelling good behaviour, modelling, you know, good um, experiments you know can I model for you what I'm going to do you may have like theory experiment well what is an experiment we can say well we're just going to try something in science we call that an experiment this is how we're going to do it you know scientists can explain this just putting it in simple language mm -hmm. then referring to teaching them that this is experiment and then next time using the word experiment in the explanation because you've already given them you know the um the explanation of that word mm -hmm. you know what can we predict what does predict mean well predict sort of means sort of guess but you know have a good idea as we guess well now how are we going to predict and in, and if you're lucky enough to go another week if it's part of a six-week program by the end of it I think you could expect to use those words and the children fully understand them yeah 
And even at a very simple level, words like engineering, that engineering is not in the primary curriculum. We are all engineers. So even introducing what engineering is, what engineers do, and then referring back to it. So yeah, I think terminology and not being afraid to use words that maybe we think are a bit more complicated, but like you say, introducing it, but maybe like Ian said, test test their knowledge first, because maybe they do know it, or some of the children do know it, which is which is brilliant. I think yes. also um, one thing I think is really important with children is like a relevance. A relevance, you know, what do engineers do? What in their life has been created by an engineer? Mm -hmm. What part does engineering play in their world? Um, one of the things that I found really mind blowing was when my daughter started working in chemical engineering, the oil refinery where she worked, one of the byproducts, one of the chemicals is used to make post-it notes. Well, I love a post-it note. Kids love <laughs> post-it notes. It's like, that's what you do. That's what chemical engineering, you know, actually produces. It's things like that. Like, you know, what, who is an engineer? And mostly, how can you become their hero that that's who they want to become? You mm -hmm. know, we want to inspire children to become engineers and mathematicians and scientists. Well, by being someone that they can connect with and can look up to and can become their science hero, these are, our, these are our future. These are the future people who are going to follow on from you. And I just believe that, you know, everyone in, in, in this group can make that difference to the children. We need to be in front of them to give them the, you know, you need to be a real person for them. They can be one of you. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, and we can talk to them about, yeah, exactly what we do and the route that we took to get there and sort of going back to their point in their journey, how you went from their point where they are now to where you are now in stepping through, you know, then I chose to continue learning about maths and science when I was at secondary school or I took computing or I took design technology and then I went on to university or the different options available. And sometimes because in engineering, there are so many routes into engineering, it can be daunting for the person, the single STEM ambassador to kind of feel that they can get that information across effectively. And we're actually going to have a standalone STEM ambassador training session on giving advice for routes into engineering at a later stage and all the resources that us as STEM ambassadors can tap into to help make our life even easier and be able to inspire kids and inform them in a really effective way. Um, but I think, like you were saying, just being able to tell our story and be a real person, a real role model for them is so valuable. And there are there are but there are so many resources out there that we can tap into to help us do that in a really inspiring way as well. And we're going to have a whole session on that um, later on this year. Brilliant. Um, any other questions for Kelly or anybody else want to share what they've been doing at a primary level? Yes, John, thank you. Hi. Um, I, as, as you may know, I, I do a lot of shows and exhibitions, but I went into, I've done several schools, and I went into a primary school about two or three weeks ago now, and um, they had it so very well organised. Um, I, it was a very full day, because I had um, two groups from every year group come through during the day, mm -hmm. and the same session for each. Um, I took in models of a four-stroke engine and a wind turbine, which you might think is a bit, bit advanced for primary school, but they loved it. Um, four-stroke engine, I said, you can go home and tell your parents or tell whoever's there how a four-stroke engine works. It's simply on a sock, squeeze, bang, blow system. <laughs> I love that. Sock, squeeze, bang, blow. They knew how an engine worked. We talked about wind turbines, but what what I really loved about that day was um, I've recently made a, a pinball type machine which I'm taking into shows, and it's uh, it's a quiz, but it's they, they have to operate the pinball by answering questions, and I'd pre uh, prepared previously I'd asked the teachers for questions based on their specific curriculum items. So they were very, very much in line with what they were learning at school. And uh, 
they had to answer the questions and then operate various parts of the pinball. And they loved it. And I trialed, it was a trial there, actually. I hadn't tried it elsewhere before on children. And uh, they really loved it. I got the comment, that's the best quiz ever. <laughs> so I, I knew it worked when I got that. But uh, the fact that they could answer questions based on their curriculum and then have fun with it. And I think that's, you mentioned it earlier, having fun is the, is the, is the important thing there. So. That's mine. Oh, that's fantastic, John. You'll have to, if you've got any pictures of that pinball machine, you'll have to share them with us at some point in a, in a future one. Yeah, I did. A, I didn't take pictures at the time. I was too busy, but every teacher that came in, they loved it as well. But they, they were taking dozens of pictures. I've asked for some, but I haven't had any yet. So. Great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I've used think... it in another show, so I'll, I'll try and get one sometime. Great. Yeah, no, I think it's such a good point. Having fun, being relevant, checking with the teacher, and especially now, like you mentioned, Kelly, you know, teachers are so overwhelmed. They've got so much to do because of trying to catch up from COVID. So if there is a way that making it curriculum relevant so that it actually is helping reinforce and build what the teachers need to cover with the children anyway, um, then that can be really helpful. And some topics that are relevant at curriculum level for primary school, things like forces, things like sound, um, you know, thinking scientifically. So like you said, predicting what might happen and testing it and recording. So being able to reinforce those skills and that knowledge that are curriculum relevant at a primary level will make you, you know, the teacher will be a fan of yours even more, I imagine. For sure. Excellent, excellent. Um, awesome. Well, feel free. Any more questions for Kelly, please put them in the chat. Um, one thing that we promised we would do in this session is signpost anybody who isn't aware of the uh, iMechE STEM at home range to that. And I can see Yelena's already put that in the chat, which is great. And I wanted to share one of the activities, which is a bridge bonanza one, which is a really simple one to do but you can differentiate it very much so you can do it at very sort of simple level and helping the children with some of the basic elements of bridge building through to older children kind of completely leave them to it and let them work it out for themselves and one of the great things about this activity is you've got a video tutorial on the iMeki website and it's part of the stem at home range that you can get the free resources to deliver this with a, with a class of children. So for example, got some here, you can get all the things you need. So bulldog clips, um, clothes, pegs, and you get these sent to you in a box of stuff from the IMA key, um, ice lolly sticks, uh, some blue tack. So you can get all of that. So you don't need to fork out for these resources. You can request the box and then take that along with you to the school. And this kind of thing is so simple. Um, yeah, Ian said, can you send this chat or links to us by email? Yes, you'll get a recording and the recording, I think, will have that chat or otherwise. Yes, we can uh, look at sending the links out. Yeah, so you've got those. OK, so just very quickly, I just wanted to show you how simple this can be when you're doing a bridge building with the children. You can literally show them how to make just a straight connection like that with a bulldog clip and two of the lolly sticks together. But also that's just a straight joint. But you can also show them how to make an angle joint with two lolly sticks like that and then the bulldog clip on top like that. And of course, when you then connect them together, you can make triangle shape, which we know is a very strong shape. And in the resources, it, it helps you bit by giving you some of the key STEM messages to reinforce or key engineering messages to reinforce about why triangles are a strong shape and how we can connect triangles together to call it a truss shape and how we have truss structures are very common in things like buildings and bridges particularly to make a very strong shape so and even getting the children to kind of wiggle it around and noticing that when it's just a, a straight joint it can wiggle quite easily when it's an angle joint it can wiggle quite easily but once you make it into a triangle that's very very difficult to wiggle it so it's a much more rigid structure and then when you put all these together and you can obviously 
give them the introduction of let's have a practice of making these different elements and then you can bring it all together like one I made earlier over here and there you go can you see that so that's literally just those same shapes and elements but all connected together and then you can have a fun kind of competition and we love a competition element um, where you can then put some weights on your bridge and see what kind of weight each bridge from each team so get them into small teams can withstand for for say 10 seconds and then see who is the winner who's made the strongest bridge just purely out of lolly sticks bulldog clips a few elastic bands some blue tack and this is a great thing like kelly was saying earlier you can set them off on it and then leave them to it so they are working in teams and you can go around the team and kind of actually get some interaction going and, and reinforce what they're doing and uh, catch them when they're being good those kind of things reinforcing that good good behavior so I'm aware we've spent a lot of the session talking and and getting some really amazing hints and tips from Kelly so thank you so much for that we're very much coming to the end of the time so I just want to say a huge thank you to Kelly your kind of insight and advice and tips a very, very doable, very accessible, something we can all absolutely take away and start implementing right away, which is very, very helpful. Um, so I just want to say a, a huge thank you from us at the IMECI for coming in and helping us. Um, does Yelena want to say anything in the closing minute? No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your time and everybody who's joined us tonight. And please do tune in and join us again um, and share the information. I won't keep anybody from their dinners. Yes, brilliant. Hopefully see you all soon in our future events where we'll be doing more, more signposting to these interactive activities you can run and more hints and tips about how to be a really effective STEM ambassador.